Hello, I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to dive into the beginning of the civil rights movement and talk about some of the early phases of sort of the direct action campaigns and boycotts that are going to lead to some of the landmark Supreme Court rulings that really help fuel the civil rights movement going forward. So let's dive in, talk about the civil rights movement, some of their successes, some of their failures, and what a lot of the takeaways are from this. So here are your objectives for today. Let's take a moment and then dive in. Of course, the landmark Supreme Court ruling that made the civil rights movement or a lot of the civil rights movement or led to it increasing in speed is Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka. As you hopefully know, Brown v. Board is the case that struck down Plessy v. Ferguson. Uh, it was a test case that was put forth by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund is, of course, an organization set up within the NAACP to help push test cases to strike down unjust laws. And Brown v. Board is an amalgamation of a number of different cases across a variety of different states, you know, from Maryland to Arizona to Kansas. And the important ruling here is that Brown v. Board, here's the number of the different places, so uh, South Carolina, Virginia, sorry, Maryland, uh, New Jersey, and then, of course, Kansas. Uh, it was argued by, again, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and specifically Thurgood Marshall, who was one of the chief counsels of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, with the goal being, again, arguing that segregation of schools was detrimental to children of color. And the Supreme Court ruling clearly establishes this. I'm assuming you're familiar with Earl Warren's famous uh, majority opinion, but if not, take a moment, read. Let's move on. And so Brown v. Board eliminated school segregation or struck down school segregationist laws in these states. But applying it to a bunch of other states is going to be incredibly problematic. There was substantial pushback from the establishment in a lot of these states. Obviously, in some places like Topeka, they simply desegregated schools. And there were some issues with that. And if you're interested in school desegregation in Topeka, there's a whole bunch of literature out there about the unintended consequences of some of these uh, policies. But in places like Alabama, you've got George Wallace standing in front of the schoolyard and declaring segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And in other parts of the South, you've got a lot of really well thought through slogans here that are being used to argue that segregation is natural and that getting rid of it is detrimental for a whole bunch of very, very rational reasons. Yeah. Uh, the most famous case of school desegregation is, of course, the Little Rock Nine in 1957, so a couple years after Brown v. Board. Ten students tried to enroll at Little Rock Central High School in Little Rock, uh, Arkansas. Uh, nine of them ended up actually going. The governor pledged both to not support them and generally to not protect the students as they went to school. And so when they showed up, they faced mobs, they faced uh, harassment, they were barred from entering the school building. And so this massively humiliated the Eisenhower administration, both because, you know, it made us look super bad on the world stage. And then, of course, because the governor of Arkansas is refusing to follow a Supreme Court ruling. And so you get federal troops, the National Guard showing up, escorting students to class for the better part of a school year. Orville Faubus here, the governor of Arkansas, is less than thrilled about this. And in general, it was incredibly traumatic for these students. So take a moment and read the accounts of what these students suffered in order to try to push forward this landmark, this enforce this landmark legislation. And there was massive backlash to this across the South as it became clear that the Eisenhower administration was actually going to enforce this Supreme Court decision. What you started seeing is the closing of schools throughout the South. Rather than allowing schools to be integrated, the schools closed for everybody and we simply lost a school year because, of course, you know, there's a lot of reasons to not have people together. And ugh, I don't know, a lot of really, really well thought through arguments, as you can see here. And so you get the closing of schools and the general trend was then the opening of private schools throughout the South and throughout parts of the North. Because uh, the, in the end, the federal, the federal ruling applied to public schools. If you create private schools, you can create whatever sort of requirements you want. And although it's illegal to segregate people by race in private schools, there are a whole bunch of ways to get around this. And so 
many states are going to defund their public schools and funnel that money into the creation of what were called segregation academies, these private schools. You're going to see a substantial increase in private school attendance, both in the uh, South and in the rest of the United States. And it's going to have lasting uh, implications. I mean, if you've never looked at the Opportunity Atlas as far as uh, providing opportunity for poor people to have social mobility, you should definitely check out the Opportunity Atlas at some point. The legacy of these segregation academies and the defunding of public schools is with us to this day. So uh, the school desegregation movement, somewhat successful, although again, uh, pretty much a mixed bag. In the end, what you start getting is de facto segregation. You start getting, uh, in both the North and the South, and uh, honestly, specifically the North, you start seeing uh, segregation happening by neighborhoods, segregation happening through redlining, through not giving loans to Black people to live in specific areas, to the community school movement, where, again, the schools only serve specific districts, and the drawing of lines in order to keep white students in specific schools and and non-white students in other schools. And so the end result of this is our schools are still predominantly segregated and attempts to sort of remedy that through busing and other sort of uh, remedies have been marginally successful, but generally face some substantial backlash. And so to what extent has the desegregation movement in schools been successful? Mm, you know, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, the murder of Emmett Till is also going to really spark the civil rights movement. Uh, Emmett Till was from Chicago. It was a young kid from Chicago who went down south and was accused of whistling at a white woman in Mississippi. And he was then murdered by these two guys who were then acquitted by an all-white jury. Uh, his family chose to have an open casket in order to sort of highlight the horrible brutality and violence still present in the south. And it really shook a lot of Americans out of their complacency and helped build support for increasing civil rights, for the dismantling of Jim Crow, for the, the idea that something had to happen to try to break down the sort of status quo, which was clearly not OK. Anti-lynching legislation was mostly still stymied by Southern representatives. And so in the end, uh, we still have no effective anti-lynching laws. And this is still something that we're struggling with. And so lynching is something that's still around and something that uh, is going to continue to be a problem because of lack of a sort of national support for any sort of lynch anti-lynching legislation. As far as more successful, uh, the economic pressure movements, such as the Montgomery bus boycott. You're, of course, hopefully remember, familiar with Rosa Parks. Uh, you might not be familiar with the fact that she was part of a larger movement to do this and had significant support behind her. It wasn't necessarily just one woman refusing to get up from the bus. It was uh, She was a secretary of a local chapter of the NAACP, and she was chosen because she would be a sympathetic figure to be arrested as part of this test case. And so she refused to give up her seat. She was arrested. And then leaders in Montgomery, eventually supported by national civil rights leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., organized the Montgomery bus boycott. So here's the uh, response. Just take a moment, read, and we'll come back together. And so as a result of this, the black citizens of Montgomery did not take the buses for a significant portion for a significant amount of time. And as a result of this, put economic pressure on the city of Montgomery, which in the end decided to integrate their buses. And so economic pressure was successful where sort of just Supreme Court rulings were not. MLK becomes this national figure as part of this, and he's going to embrace a platform of nonviolence. We see him here after uh, the attempted assassination attempt. MLK is going to model a lot of his actions on sort of Gandhi and the Indian independence movement, focusing on attempting to win not just, you know, Supreme Court battles, but also win in the court of public opinion, understanding that it was important to get white liberals on his side and to appear to be sort of above reproach. And so this is going to be common in this early phase of the civil rights movement is really attempting to reach across the aisle, build a broad coalition and win the public relations battle, not just, you know, not just win battles in the courts and through legislation. 
For the election of 1960, uh, Eisenhower, of course, is term limited. We didn't talk about this, but when uh, the Republicans took over after uh, Truman, they were going to pass an amendment to the Constitution, limiting a president to two terms to prevent another FDR. So Eisenhower can't run again. So Richard Nixon is going to be the Republican nominee. It's finally Nixon's day in the sun here. The Democrats are going to struggle to find a candidate. They're going to settle on the young John Fitzgerald Kennedy of Massachusetts. Uh, Kennedy had, you know, was a, the son of a sort of a politically connected family, but he had never really served uh, any appreciable amount of time in any sort of government role. So he is young and untested. And as a Yankee, there was some concern that he might not get Southern votes. And so Lyndon Johnson of Texas, the uh, consummate and incredibly skilled legislator, is going to be his vice presidential candidate, and he's going to go up against Nixon. This is one of the uh, one of the first elections in which television, especially televised debates, is going to play a huge role. JFK, and you should definitely watch these if you haven't, if you've never seen them. JFK is going to use televised debates to his advantage. He's going to uh, use makeup. He's going to practice his delivery. He's going to understand where sort of cameras are. And that's really going to help him uh, develop a rapport and a connection with America, whereas Nixon's going to really struggle. Nixon uh, tried to travel to all the states in a very sort of traditional campaigning fashion. He got sick. He ended up hurting his knee. And when he showed up on these televised debate stages, he just didn't look as presidential and as capable as Kennedy. And so in an incredibly, incredibly tight election, Kennedy is going to win. We're also starting to see the beginning of a larger Southern revolt from the Democratic Party, uh, independent segregationist candidates winning states and winning votes. But in an in incredibly, incredibly close race, Kennedy is going to become president of the United States in 1960. And Nixon's going to go back to California and sulk and insult the press and, uh, you know, bide his time, more or less. Kennedy is a young, projects the image of a young, vital president. He's going to bring in his brother to be attorney general, which is super questionable, considering I don't think Bobby was qualified to be attorney general. He's going to bring in a lot of young Harvard, a sort of Ivy League educated people to be members of his cabinet. He's, his wife is beautiful. He's got young children in the White House. And he's going to protect, project this sense of youth and vitality to sort of usher in a new age in American history. And so the Kennedy administration is going to be ushered in with a lot of optimism for a lot of people, despite the fact that Kennedy himself doesn't have a lot of uh, sort of legislative accomplishments to his name. But despite that, uh, he's going to start up the Peace Corps in order to try to expand sort of both to help out people in the developing world and to expand America's soft power. And Kennedy's famously going to pledge to get us to the moon by the end of the decade, significantly increasing our investment in sort of uh, space exploration and kicking the space race into sort of high gear. And so uh, Kennedy, with his slogan, The New Frontier, is going to be a very inspiring figure for most Americans. And we're going to move into the 1960s with a real sense of optimism and uh, a sense that the United States has turned a corner here and we're moving forward. So we'll leave that here for now. Obviously, uh, we've got a lot more to talk about, both with Kennedy, both with the Cold War, civil rights, all this sort of stuff. So we'll end there. And next time when we come back, we'll start uh, talking a little bit about foreign policy and especially this whole Cuba problem, which we kind of touched on before, but haven't really developed fully. So for now, thank you for listening.